So I have some experience with doing science exposition, so I thought that would be a cool talk. But as I started doing research, I discovered so many fantastic collaborations between climate scientists and artists that I decided to focus on that. So I guess, is it legal to switch the topic? Who cares? <laughs> anyway, so um, I'm first will tell you about exposition. Are you going to be my key puncher? My next? Oh. Oh. Okay. All right. So exposition is a type of writing where the purpose is to explain, inform, or even describe. It is considered to be one of the four most common rhetorical modes. This is according to Wikipedia. Exposition is the portion of a story that introduces important background information to the audience. Now, for science exposition, it's explaining the science so that you can make your point, your political points, or your emotional points. Um, some different ways of doing exposition are dialogue, character thoughts, and voiceover. This is primarily in fiction. Narration, or in-universe media, such as having a newspaper clipping or something in the, in the film itself or on a stage. My type of exposition in my cabarets is I do information dump, which is a really bad idea. Um, that's when you just stand there and you, and you dump. And uh, by just delivering information. In theater and film, there tends to be what they call, as you know, Bob, or the idiot lecture, where you have somebody present who's, you know, needs something explained to them. Most times it tends to be a woman. Um, even on um, the Big Bang Theory, you know, there's the woman who doesn't understand science and that they're always explaining the science to. It's the bimbo device. So, um, Exposition can be one of the most effective ways of creating an increasing drama in your story, but it can also be the quickest way to kill a plot. Um, too much exposition or too much all at once can seriously derail a story or be frustrating. That's according to Robert Kerman, who wrote a book on building better plots. Um, why to avoid it? See, right now I'm doing exposition, and it's going. we're good, drawing to a halt. It slows the forward movement of a plot. It robs story of conflict and tension. It amounts to lecturing the reader or forcing him to read an encyclopedia entry. It can violate viewpoint, most importantly. It's boring. Yeah, <laughs> Michael Crichton, cough. So you, the goal is to embed, especially in a film or in a story or writing, you embed the exposition. So you secretly sneak it in uh, the captain's log is actually a type of embedding the exposition. So we know like Captain Kirk does his like talking into the captain's log and can give us important information. Spock at times will like read a report. You know, I don't know why he's bending over looking into the thing. I never understood that. But um, so he'll read reports and deliver exposition that way. You can have expert testimony. Again, you can have the bimbo or you can use a song. Song is always a good way to do some exposition. There's also this new thing I found called sex position, um, which is popular in Game of Thrones, which I've never seen, or Sopranos, which I've never seen. But the, it's a new device that's being used more and often. You just have someone having sex while you're delivering the exposition. So you guys could try that next time you give a talk. Is that crass? Is that crass enough? OK, good. Um, interestingly enough, when I, um, one of the first science plays I ever saw that had a huge, huge success was the Tony Award winning uh, Copenhagen. How many people have seen that on Broadway? Yeah, I saw it on Broadway. It's very interesting. The device they use, they use the bimbo device to um, try to convey very complicated information about quantum physics, and they had a wife. So, and they literally would say, no, Heisenberg, you know, Werner, please explain it so Marta can understand, or Marguerite, or whatever. And I remember being, you know, upset in the audience. Like, what? Why do they have the dumb wife? So that was kind of a cheap... I, I would prefer that if they were having sex and, um, instead of the dumb wife. Okay. Okay, then something happened in 2005. So Copenhagen was a huge success on Broadway. You know, won the best play of the year. In 2005, Bill McKibben wrote an article in Grist, What the Warming World Needs Now is Art, Sweet Art. And here's what, quote... 
Here's the paradox. If the scientists are right, we're living through the biggest thing that's happened since human civilization emerged. But oddly, though we know about it, we don't know about it. It hasn't registered in our gut. It isn't in a part of our culture. Where are the books? Where are the poems, the plays, the goddamn operas? And so artists heard this plea and acted. One of the first plays, and if you've seen these, like, give a shout out. I'm curious, because actually all the plays I'm talking about today, I haven't seen except for Copenhagen or Copenhagen. In 2006, Climate of Concern, I guess there was nine plays that were put together, short one-act plays uh, on global warming, six of them. And um, the base, here's the director. He says, scientists and policy wonks have had their chance and have not made this real for people. It's the job of artists. Okay, um, another play, The Contingency Plan, anyone see that? That's two plays, um, uh, this is, he's from the UK, but it's also, it's playing now in Australia. Um, if you're involved in theater in your community, you can always try to get one of these plays to be played in your community. Um, here there's an interview on the bottom that was done with the um, playwright. Did you, did you think you had to explain climate change to the audience? And Steve says, the author, I tried to sidestep explaining climate change. The play says it's a given. And I contacted a few playwrights um, perform, uh, preparing for this, and I asked them if they um, included exposition in their plays, and they said no, that they always just assumed that global warming was a given. Except if the play was about the debate between the trolls and the scientists. A, um, this was off-Broadway, but it was big time off-Broadway because it starred Jake uh, Gyllenhaal. Um, anybody see this? Okay, not a lot of theater people. If there is, I haven't found it yet. This is in 2012. Nick Payne is a famous playwright. And in this case, the father is obsessed with global warming. It isn't the focus of the play, but it's in the play um, as one of the characters, which is interesting. But what I find um, more useful in our pursuit to connect with the grassroots is community theater. And there are a lot of people doing amazing things in community theater with climate change that you can participate in. Um, this play by Cynthia Hopkins was in 2013. She's a performance artist. She, um, so I'm just going to read for the uh, online audience. It's difficult to find a personal connection because we're not feeling the full effects now. We have to act on behalf of people who aren't born yet. To grasp that dramatically requires imagination. I think a big part of the skepticism is because it's so terrifyingly, it's so terrifying that it's easy uh, to overwhelming and paralyzing. The challenge is to communicate that there's also hope and agency. So she did a trip to uh, the Arctic um, and we're going to play this little clip from, she did a one-woman play uh, in New York this year. There's nudity, be prepared. Sex position. This is a trailer, a little demo for it. If I had a brass band, I'd set it on a mountain And a symphony of horns would roll across Cynthia Hopkins is a distinctively special music theater maker. She has an innate theatrical uniqueness and power. This show, it, it kind of uses uh, as a... Um, my story of coming of age and being able to address issues outside of my psychodrama um, as a metaphor for my species, the human race. And I suddenly realize that alcoholism is an excellent metaphor for the climate crisis. We're addicted to behavior that is making us sick. It is a piece called This Clement World, and it's Cynthia meditating on the state of the world and climate change and global warming. And she equates that to her own challenges around alcoholism in her earlier years. But in the Arctic, it's impossible not to notice that we're actually lucky to have survived thus far. Hallelujah, 
So that's a uh, interesting metaphor, alcoholism and climate change, being addicted to things that are making us sick. So um, that's one example. She got a lot of press in the New York Times, two articles in the New York Times talking about the theater of climate change. And um, this is Cape Farewell. How many people have heard of this? Yay, lots of people. Okay, Cape Farewell is in the UK. It's a collaboration between artists and scientists focusing on the Arctic. Another artist, so what they do is they send artists and scientists up to the Arctic to experience it and film it. Um, and so she was one of those artists. Ne oh, me, I'm doing it. Sorry, I just like bossing you around. Um, so she's producing a series, a six cycle play called The Arctic. Uh, oh, not her, I'm sorry. Another artist is Chantel. Billadu, who might be on, she was going to um, be tweeting live with us while I showed her work. Um, she also was a part of the Cape Farewell Project and went up to the Arctic. She's producing a six-place cycle that explores uh, climate change in the Arctic. And the first place she's producing is Scylla. It's going to be produced at the Underground Railway Theater in collaboration with MIT in 2014. And uh, this is a collaboration. There's a couple folks here from MIT. I was wondering if you were involved with this group called Catalyst Collaborative, which is a collaboration between scientists and climate scientists and artists. I asked her, I contacted her, and I asked her, what are your strategies for dealing with exposition when doing performance for a non-scientific audience? And she replied, I can't really claim to use a lot of science, at least not so far. There is mention of climate science and even a climate scientist character in one of my plays, but the science is secondary. The play is more about policy and geopolitics than science. So she also has a blog called Artist and, the Cl and Climate Change, which has many different um, artists and scientists um, that she's reporting and blogging on, and different uh, writers also blogging on the site, which is pretty awesome. I'm going to skip over this stuff because I, we don't have time. She wrote this excellent article, which I have tweeted, and I think she's going to tweet again. This just came out in the theater, um, what does it say, communications group. And she, this is a pretty much uh, very... In, um, extensive article looking at all the different plays that are being done on climate change and the history of plays and climate change. So you should check that out. Um, another group is called the Civilians, and they're funded by $700,000 arts grant from NSF. I don't know, anybody collaborating with them? See, these are all groups you can collaborate with, or you can go to your local community theater and offer to um, be a consultant. So this is a, another collaborative uh, between scientists and artists. And The Great Immensity is a play that was done. We're going to play a short clip for that. It's a fictional story about climate change. And I think you're really going to No one's laughed. We have not had, not had a lot of laughs yet, but this one will get some laughs. Why isn't it work? It worked earlier. Well, playwrights are good at telling stories, so if climate scientists collaborate with them, they can help you in your storytelling, and you can help them in their storytelling. So I think it's an exciting way. And while he's you ready, oh, no, that's not the right one. Okay, you work on, what is going on? There's a, some voodoo going on. Another um, thing that's exciting at the grassroots level is the Grange movement. And do you guys all know about the Grange in the United States? The farmers, the Grange? How many people know about the Grange? How many people are members of a Grange? Okay, right on. The Grange is greening. It's the most progressive environmental group in your neighborhood. And it used to, you know, so it's something to consider to join. Uh, the Granges are doing a lot of progressive green um, outreach and programs. And they're farmers, and they're going to be hit and uh, by the climate change. Are we ready? I, I don't want to skip that one. But why don't you just click on it? What's up with that? God, it's a really good one. Maybe I'll play it for you later. It is so good. I'll tweet it. I'm sad. Okay, go. This is a blog that they also do. Another group is called Superhero Clubhouse. Not only do they produce original plays for adult audiences, they also produce plays with children. So go to the next. Oh, sorry, I got you doing 
Get on the slides now. Here's the big green theater. Every summer they get a group of children who write their own plays about climate change and then are put on um, by the organization. This is in Brooklyn. And next. And then uh, here's a, they did a climate science cabaret, which was inspired by climate scientists, featuring five um, climate scientist women. Let's see if you can get this one to work, because it's hilarious. I can end on a... So if you click on it when it's in the PowerPoint, it doesn't... Yeah, it worked when we were pr testing it. Go back to the PowerPoint. All right, here's a playwright from New York. He won a prize for this. We'll play a little bit of it. From the beginning. Being a Republican presidential candidate, uh, that's probably all you need to know. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Fuorola, if elected president, what would you do to address the threat of global warming? Facts are depressing, <laughs> especially when they flatly contradict your view. Facts are also confusing, since they tend to suggest there's not one side, but two. So when I'm faced with lots of facts and I start feeling sad, I go and change the channel. And things don't seem so bad. There's no global warming on Fox. The evidence is mixed at best. There's no global warming on Fox. Poor Al Gore can take a rest. So what if Venice gets a little wetter? Could be the climate change. All right, so I guess I'm closing now. I'm going to, um, let me just go through some, here's some, the thing, of, um, Tipping Point is a group in UK. Anybody hear about that group? They have a, yeah, they have a program. This is inspiring, I think. On July 2nd, they're doing a program on explaining uncertainty for playwrights and artists. So I, we're, the United States is way behind the curve on UK and Europe. And here's another uh, program, festival on climate change in Europe. And, um, I, yeah, so lots more, yeah, male voice of science. I'm going to do a show called, yeah, I'm going to do a show that blends a uh, daily show, Saturday Night Live, Carl Sagan, and the Physics Show on Two is coming soon. Um, so stay tuned. Thanks.